Eric Lang, president and co-founder of Zipcrow. Thank you so much for joining me on the Vertical Farming Podcast. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it. So I think we connected via the team at Indoor Ag Tech. You guys had a booth, if I remember. Yeah, correctly. yeah, we've been yeah we've been to a few booths, uh, a few uh, conferences lately, and uh, it's nice to get back out in the world. So um, yeah, that was great. What's the last one you've been to? Uh, actually, coincidentally, the last one I went to was was uh, a very kind of a small, more localized one for real traditional um, farming. It was called the International Plowing Match. Okay. which is like like real old school farms and and that was actually fantastic it was a whole different world than the you know indoor egg con concepts so yeah. it was actually really great what are some of the topics covered at a conference like that um that is the the, the biggest issue is not issue the challenge we were really wondering is you know when i again i also come from a very i'm a traditional farming background so yeah. big dairy farm Grew up my whole life. I still actually own a beef farm and, and lamb. We used to do, my wife and I do lamb and beef and okay. turkey and chickens and all that traditional stuff. And I choose to live where I am as a, as a, as a lifestyle choice. But, you know, attending a conference where you're dealing with large, you know, cash crop farmers or, or whatever the old traditional style, which, you know, we, this industry, we don't really touch as much as I think we should was actually really great because we got to see that focus of like, hold on, what the fuck, what is this? <laughs> and it's like, and I expected to get all these old crotchety farmers, which again, my father was one and et cetera, right? Yeah. Um, saying this is such a gimmick. And and really they were like, huh, yeah, I get it. Like they're business, they're all business. And it was really great just to see that other, that other, uh, that other avenue that we kind of don't touch in this industry as much as we should, like traditional farmers. Yeah, so I'd love to touch touch on some of that as well. But I'm, but I'm wondering because you said you do come from a tra traditional farming background, but you studied business, I imagine, in university, and then you started to work in the plastics industry. For uh, me, so yeah, <laughs> well, on. I kind of have a bit of an issue. Um, yeah, so I actually am traditional farming background. I my my degree was actually in education. Ended up being a teacher for okay. a minute for about two minutes probably yeah. um, and then decided that didn't make sense um, I actually did an MBA seven years into my actual business just to do one because I thought I probably needed one yeah. um, although I don't know if that's really true or not yeah. Um, so yeah I was I, I just have a bit of an issue of, of I have a very big curiosity about how things work and sometimes I have a bit of an issue of once I figure out how it might maybe make sense to work, I feel like I have to start a company. <laughs> so I've had a few companies, yes. And so the, the first one was Norplast? Yeah, the first one is Norplast. It was actually a, a brokerage company, brokering okay. commodities, uh, plastics, and, and others um, from North America to uh, mostly China and also Europe and a few other places. Yeah. Um, I also then started an actual full-scale industrial recycling company doing mostly plastics. Okay. Um, and did another company doing extrusion and pelletizing and doing some biocomposites and plastic lumbers, um, nanotech, uh, some very interesting things, which were just a lot of fun. Um, I had another plastic fab company, which we were, we were doing fabrication. Um, also a packaging uh, warehousing company. Mm -hmm. And fell into uh, indoor egg, yeah. which was completely not on my radar. <laughs> so what did you learn from those early companies? Because, you know, you, you obviously had leadership roles there as well. And was um, was Nora the first time you were leading a company? Yeah, I was I was in my late 20s. And that was my first company. So I founded all those companies. Yeah. Um, and just I mean, business is business. I, yeah. If it's ag or if it's, you know, it doesn't really matter what it is. Business is yeah. business, and and eighty percent of all businesses have the same issues, same concepts, same yeah. challenges, uh, and 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 that that's what I love. I, it's also kind of an interesting coming into this um, industry because I think I think the indoor egg space, um, I think a lot of the the new companies coming into this kind of come into it as a as a tech startup. Mm. I come into it as a brick and mortar mm. concept. Okay. Because to me, I don't really consider it. I mean, there is new tech, but yeah. it's brick and mortar. We're a manufacturing company, the way I look at it, yeah. um, rather than a tech company where we get, you know, series A, B, C, D, et cetera, until we finally actually make some sales. Yeah. So I kind of go the opposite. And, and we've literally had zero funding, no series anything. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, we must make money because that's how we 
that's how we finance growth. It's a customer focused business model. When did Acta come on your radar? Um, actually, it's funny. I was, I was an investor. Um, I was kind of dragged into being an investor because of, uh, because of a, a friend who wanted me to invest in, in, uh, in her spouse, which I did. Um, and just kind of, did it as a, you know, another investment. It was kind of interesting and all of learning about new stuff. Yeah. And then the more I got into it, and again, I kind of admit I thought it was a little bit of a gimmick as well. <laughs> Coming from traditional ag and like, oh, this actually makes sense. And the more I got involved in it and the more that I was asked to come on and, you know, kind of help out in this company, et cetera. And then I ended up kind of jumping in full bore and sold my last company and started this one new as, as a new company. What were some of the, uh, it's interesting because you came in uh, probably as, maybe as an outsider with a different perspective and this brick and mortar perspective, like you said, that, you know, having interviewed several folks in, in this space, uh, that that's not always the case. And then there's a lot of folks that have had very successful rounds. And so what was your mindset coming in and, and did you feel like there was something that you could do here that you, you saw wasn't being done or something you could do differently? Yeah, I think so. I think, and again, I have nothing against, you know, series A, B, C, et cetera. And sometimes I'm like, geez, I would love to have had a couple of those and make my life a little easier. Yeah. Um, but no, my, my concept was more, and our concept here at Pensive Grow is actually more, we actually do it. Yeah. So while there's a lot of people, and again, some of them are fantastic business models in, in, in tech, but whether there's a lot of companies that are talking about, how great things are and do, spending a lot of money on their on their hype or their their you know what have you we're quietly and and behind the scenes building farms mm -hmm. everywhere, um and and kind of doing it so my concept was you know long term i'm 100 percent in we we know that this is an industry which is taking off and it will continue to take off and you know rising tide rises all boats etc but i think long term I'm looking at staying power and you know who's going to end up being those foundational companies that go to the next 10 15 20 years mm -hmm. and that's kind of how i've looked at it rather than that quick let's get big as fast as possible yeah and so coming from that traditional ag background i imagine that had to be helpful and and what learnings did you take from from what you grew how you grew up and how were you able to apply that and with uh zip grow well, I, I was actually thinking about this just this morning because dealing with some things, it's like the one thing I will, I will say, you know, traditional ag, I don't think people consider them as entrepreneurs as much as they should. Yeah. Um, and I can't even imagine a more difficult business to be in than traditional ag where, you know, just, you know, if you're a cash crop farmer or what have you, you know, eat all of your all of your income comes once a year <laughs> if you're lucky. Um, and there's just so many things that you have to do. And I think one of the big parts was you have to kind of do everything, right? So, and that's kind of how we've done, done Zipgrow. We are, we become everything. So whether it's, we, we, even though we are equipment manufacturer, patented equipment manufacturer, seller of equipment, we also of course have to be growers because we have to help teach. Um, we have to be the experts at growing. We have to be the experts at new tech. We have to constantly be developing new products. We have to be able to educate and train because as, as you know, in this industry, a lot of, a lot of potential customers actually don't have an ag background yeah. so there's we have to kind of do everything so being able to and again that's my team i'm so so proud of my team here um especially in the in the beginning stages of the business where you know everyone's wearing so many multiple hats we just have no choice but to not be too specialized and just uh, take on everything and be be everything so i think that's a big part of it just understanding that uh the as an entrepreneur you do just do it all and you just got to figure it out did you grow up in Ontario? Yeah, I grew up in Eastern Ontario, in rural Eastern Ontario, where I still currently live and I choose to live. It's a lifestyle choice. Uh, there's good and bad with that. You know, we could we could potentially have a lot bigger selection of employees and a few things, but I don't think we could ever have any have any better selection of employees. When when people choose to live here, who are talented and smart and 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 educated, and and have a great attitude but they choose to live in this rural area mm. it's kind of like we find each other and it's like those people take us to the next level what was life like growing up there i also as a dairy farm kid couldn't wait to get out so i left at 17 <laughs> as soon as i could get the heck out i got out um yeah. and then as soon as i started having kids realized holy hold on this is a great way to grow up 
and then moved home and then made my kids do the same thing. So. <laughs> <laughs> what was life like growing up on a dairy farm? It was a lot of work. Yeah. There's no breaks. Uh, dairy, especially over a lot of the other ones, like it doesn't matter, you know, Christmas, New Year's, like it's still got to milk the cows, yeah. got to milk the cows, you got to milk the cows. So um, just a lot of work, a lot of dedication. It's not something for the faint hearted, but a great way to grow up and learn a lot of different skills, a lot of different skill sets and a lot of confidence, confidence in being able to do pretty much anything because you just don't have any choice. You just do it. And that's kind of where why that we've been able to move into the manufacturing concept the way that we have is it, and is this a family business how long has it been in the family uh so yeah currently um Zipro itself is not a family business uh, necessarily anymore my farm is yeah. i'm still actually I, I work for now for my wife because my wife's now a full-time farmer okay uh, and now my uh, my my to-do lists are a little different than some people's minds. They build the hay and uh, clean up the barns <laughs> on the weekends and evenings. <laughs> but uh, Zipco itself uh, is currently uh, is currently separate but equal on our radar of yeah. our lifestyle choices, kind of thing. Is it, I imagine some of that ethic from growing up on the farm. This this mindset of you know you got to work with your hands. You got to you got to find find solutions to problems in the moment that they happen. You know, you got to be re really resourceful. Um, and it's just a, like, a, I imagine a work ethic that has to carry through in, in your subsequent endeavors. It's 100%. And that's like I mentioned, one of the reasons I love being out in this area, even though we have maybe less of a choice of employee, when I find those other farm kid concepts who yeah. still want to live in this area, but are, are talented and skill set. Yeah, they can do anything. They can and do do everything. And, and there's, I should say, I don't ever hear it's not my job where it's just like, oh, okay, let's, let's, let's get on that. Let's figure it out. Yeah. I mean, where sometimes, you know, I, I, I love engineers and, and I have a couple, but, you know, you don't necessarily have to be an engineer to figure problems out and fix and yeah. have solutions. So and I think that's fantastic. You just need some duct tape. <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> And so how do you think about building a team when, you know, you we talked a little bit about talent, about availability, what's there on the ground. Obviously, you know, there's people rethinking what is and isn't possible with remote work. COVID shook a lot of things up. So, you know, how what was your perspective when you were starting the company and, and how has that evolved over the years? Um, I think it, I think it's a little similar to what we were discussing. It's finding it's finding a attitude. Um, I, my the older I get and the more companies I've, I've been involved in now what I really search for an employee is more obviously work ethic which we all which we all want but uh, a desire to learn desire to learn everything just mm. just a passion for education and learning um, we just and, you know being a smaller company we're only at you know 20 some employees now um, but there's there's just not room for doing one thing over and over it's just like oh and, and and so many new things come up regularly and every day it's like like oh this is so cool we just learned this let's let's implement this or let's try this or let's try this and it's like the excitement and the excitement is contagious as well so i'm trying to find people definitely not like me but with that mindset of trying because we don't want too many of those but uh, with that mindset of you know just the the desire to learn the desire of, of being better just constantly striving choosing to live in a rural community but being better than, you know, just, you know, doing one thing. Uh, it, you don't have to be in downtown Toronto or New York or, or LA to find really good employees. I imagine you, you cut your teeth on what to do and what not to do when it comes to hiring the right folks. So when you're starting Zip Grow, I, I'm always curious about, you know, those, those first couple of hires are so key because they, they almost set the foundation for what the, the culture is going to be like at the company. So how do you think about that and, and, and how much of what you learned from your previous companies influence your, those decisions? I'm a huge believer in culture, Harry, um, especially with smaller companies. Uh, culture is everything, you know, getting the right people in the bus, that, that whole concept. And, you know, I, yeah. you know, when I'm doing my MBA, I used to think getting the right people in the bus meant getting the most skilled people until I actually did the case study in my MBA, which doesn't mean that at all. It literally means getting the people who believe the same as you do yeah. to go to the same direction. I'm like, wow, once you, once you get to that point, you understand that everyone on the same team going in the same direction is fantastic can just go like crazy um, as opposed to you know just getting really smart talented people all doing their own thing in their own little silos yeah. 
it just doesn't you can be you can have the most talented team in the world but if they're not all going in the same direction you're not going to get anywhere and yeah. that's been a huge focus is just getting those that right people especially in those first you know those first couple of years of it's like you know we all have to do everything it's like and when you find that person like yeah that's what i want to do it's like oh wow like that's a great employee yeah, yeah, yeah. You're like, oh, there's more people like me. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully not too many. <laughs> how have you matured or evolved as, as a leader over the course of the companies? And, and how's, how have you taken those lessons and applied that to, to, to Zipco? Uh, great question. Just completely generic business question, which I love. Um, that's interesting. So uh, the biggest thing is as I become more mature, uh, debatable, I guess, depending on who you ask, <laughs> It, it's you know just hiring people smarter than you and, and mm -hmm. start yeah. stop trying to be everything to everyone, admitting when you just don't know it. Look, I'm mm -hmm. not a techie, I'm not a techie in any shape or form. I love the concepts, I love learning it, and I want to know enough to know whether or not something is being done correctly. Uh, but just hiring people who kick my butt mm -hmm. in skills and in and knowledge and, and brain power and like why would I not? And so. I think just be, being, you know, mature enough or or confident enough to say, yeah, these people are way smarter than me. Let's hire them yeah, yeah. <laughs> instead of trying to feel like I have to be, you know, the the, the be all and end all to everyone else. So that's, I've changed a lot over the years on that, and it's it's a great thing. Let's just go a lot quicker. It's so, all about the team. It's all about the team. The team yeah. is. So coming from a traditional ag, I'm, I'm wondering, um, as you as you start to build Zipco, are you looking to see what others are doing? Do you just know that you have enough experience in the industry to get started in, in this? I'm just curious how you decide what the offering is going to be on day one, um, who your customer is going to be, and you know what what um, you know who, who the target audience is uh, as in, in those early days. Well, actually, I think that's a that's a great question, Harry, because I think the reality is coming from traditional ag. As much as I do absolutely believe in the product, I believe in the industry, I believe in changing the world, I believe in in feeding people. Yeah, I also come from the from the perspective is it has to have an ROI. Yeah, you can't just hope and and feel good about doing something great and not ever actually make money or not ever actually just spend other people's you know equity investment and then end up you know doing nothing so for for that perspective we everything we've done has to come from the perspective of this customer has to eventually make money or hopefully make money day one or year one rather um and that's how we look at it because i've been there <laughs> like i get this this is not i'm not i'm not only selling a good idea i'm selling a business yeah. and what we've ended up realizing is we, we, we actually, our slogan now is, you know, Zipro, we grow farmers. Like we mm -hmm. actually take someone who has no idea sometimes yeah. what they're doing and sometimes they're putting their life savings into this. And I take that mm -hmm. very seriously. I'm not just, you know, here's buy some equipment, see you later, goodbye. We now have to help you succeed. Yeah. So a big focus of Zipro and always has been education support, especially post, uh, post uh, sales support we need to help them actually succeed because this is now a business. Yeah. So we are actually helping people be uh, start businesses, start farms, become new farmers. So in ROI is the perspective I think I bring that a lot of do not is literally, I understand these people, these customers, this could be their life savings. Yeah. They have to make money, they have to get a return. So that's how I focus what we try to create and sell. Yeah, it's really important, especially with folks that are moving into the space. Uh, you know, they, they may have the passion, but they, if they don't have the education, if they don't understand the business that they're getting into and, and all the aspects of running a business, to your point, ROI, like not only just you can be the best grower, uh, and, and but at the end of the day, if no one's buying your stuff, <laughs> then it's just going to sit there. So, you know, how do you, how do you think about um, all the different phases and all the different skill sets that a successful farmer needs to have? And, and to prepare to prepare them for for this journey. Yeah, well, I don't think I ever could think of all of them, but I will tell you that uh, you know, we see we see a couple things. Um, the, you know, the further we are we are in this, and again, we've been selling commercial farms for ten years, yeah. so this is like we've seen a lot of farmers. I mean, there are times that we're doing we're building a farm a week. Like we've just seen a lot of farms out there. We've helped a lot of people start businesses. 
Um, and I, I see a couple of things. I see the biggest, probably the biggest challenge I see for a lot of people is they think that indoor farming is a machine and you turn it on and it makes lettuce um, or, or what have you. And I'm like, okay, well, when I buy it, how much am I going to get? How much produce am I getting? Well, I can tell you what somebody has got, but I cannot tell you what you're going to get because they kind of think it's just a machine. And I, and I do find this as a big issue, especially coming from a traditional background, it's still farming. And it comes with all the issues that farming and risks that farming comes with. The other thing I see as well is I see, you know, predominantly two type of people who want to get into this as a new industry that do not come from this as a background. One is somebody who just desperately wants to get out of an office or get out of, you know, whatever their situation is and just wants to grow. They want to be connected with what they do. They just want to be in there and, and grow and, and be a farmer. But they don't actually like people. They don't know how to sell. They don't know how to market, nor do they ever want to. The other type of person we see quite often is that people who really love people and they love this yeah. idea, they love this concept, and they love this story and they want to be connected, but spend eight hours or 10 hours or 12 hours a day in the farm working. Well, they don't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> so we see these two dichotomies and, I, and I, we always, I always find it just fascinating. It's like, this is a business. You have to do it all. Or you have to at least have a partner or hire somebody to do the other side of it. So I think that's one of the challenges we, we see is like, this isn't just to save the world. And I'm fin I, I love being in an industry that I can feel good about, but it's also a business. It's also farming. It actually has all the risks associated with it. And a prime example, we'll have, and I won't say what city because the people could figure out what it is. I have a particular, there's a particular city in the U.S., northern U.S., that I sold two farms, identical farms, identical equipment. In a smaller city, you know, mid-range city, one farmer is just killing it, buying phase two, just killing it. The next farmer is like, well, this doesn't work. It's the same equipment. It's the same city. It's the same yeah. customers. Yeah. So I think I think in this whole industry, whether it's us or any other equipment manufacturer, the equipment doesn't make food. The equipment is how you make your food and how you end up farming. It's just the tool. It's like a tractor. And that's how I look at it. Do you know enough now or just with your experience in conversations with potential farmers looking to get started? Um, if someone has the proclivity or, or um, the potential to succeed, you know, do, do you know like, what are, what are the things that make up someone? What are you looking for, or what are the what are the traits of someone who's who's looking to get into this and may not maybe bite enough more than they, they could chew? No pun intended. No, I, I I do, and actually, I think I find it. I think there's surprise when I start sometimes in a conversation where they might come to the boardroom and start chatting about. You know this or that and i they feel like i'm discouraging them i'm not discouraging them i just want to make sure they understand again i don't want to i also have my human i don't want to feel like somebody you know i'm not trying to convince somebody to buy our equipment and, and start this new career and if it doesn't work for them you know whatever i would much rather a successful farmer because they sell more farms for me um so yes we definitely see it and, and it comes down to making sure they are aware of both sides of the story. There's the farming and there's, you still have to market and sell this product. It's still a product, it's a widget. I mean, in some respects, it's not like selling corn or soybeans where you just put it on the market, right? Um, and then the other side of that um, coin, I think, is um, just making sure that people are aware that it's just still work. <laughs> This isn't just a machine. It doesn't, I don't care what system you buy and I don't care how automated it is. I don't care what kind of AI there is. And I don't care if it's, you can look at it on your phone in the cloud, which we all do. That isn't farming. That is just telling you if there's an issue potentially and potentially it doesn't tell you every issue. So I've actually had people like, well, I, I can go away for the week and go on holidays. Like, no, <laughs> you can't. <laughs> if you do, you better at least have someone there. Like this is still yeah. farming get that through your head. So that's kind of why I guess that's one advantage of coming from traditional is like trying to make people understand that because I, I really, I think sometimes we as an industry do a disservice from being overly anxious to sell product mm. without making sure of the success of the customer. Yeah. Yeah. I think what happens is it sort of damages the whole industry because the, the people who haven't had success or who who failed at it will then go back and say yeah try that vertical farming thing doesn't work yep. and and you know to your point they haven't 
put in the time and, and they don't realize what was involved when they were getting um, into it from the, in, in the first place. So just uh, for, for the benefit of the listener, can you describe what the current product offering is for ZipGrow and what are the different markets you're serving? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're very, we're very proud of what we've been doing, especially lately. We've been really pushing the envelope a little bit. Um, and again, maybe it's my issue of being uh, entrepreneurial and wanting to do everything. But we we have everything for currently from online hobby. You know, I, I've seen you know some of your past podcasts from that in house system in your kitchen, etc. Uh, we do very well with that. We've been doing that for a very long time. Um, to you know, school and education is also a big thing for us. We're very committed to educating um, students and, and young people and making sure they understand and actually have an opportunity to get connected with the food they eat and understand where it comes from. So we're, we've got a big push in education, schools, um, research and development with the universities, et cetera. But of course, our bread and butter is still commercial farms. So we do commercial greenhouse farms. We do commercial warehouse, indoor vertical farms. A lot of them, that's our main bread and butter. Um, and we also have our newest product, which is our zip pod, which is a containerized farm, which we've developed from the ground up. It's not a shipping container. It is a purpose built container for being able to farm in a vertical farming sense in, in a containerized version, which we call the zip pod. Very happy with that. We just released that. So we kind of have the whole gamut right now. And of course, everything is built around our patented tower. It's tower growing truly vertical. We, we call ourselves truly vertical instead of stack trays and, and it's nothing against the other side of it, but that's what we do. Do you see a lot of folks dipping their toe in the water, starting with one of the, the, the smaller offerings and then, you yeah. know, realizing what's involved and then, you know, getting excited at, at what's possible and, and to grow into something bigger? Yeah. And, you know, it kind of goes back to that last question prior as, as far as, you know, what do we do with those customers that really are, you know, desperate wanting to get into this? And sometimes instead of trying to sell them a commercial farm, which they don't know what they're doing yet, it's like, look, let's just try this small system, <laughs> you know, play with this in your garage or your backyard or, or your kitchen or whatever, and understand the concept because a lot of people really truly have no clue. We, we deal with small and small to medium sized farms. We're not doing the 100,000 square footers. That's, you know, the plenties of the world, and we don't even want to touch that. We do commercially viable small to medium farms, and I, don't, I think a lot of companies out there don't think that that's a thing, but we do this every day. We, we are building farms, you know, weekly, if not, you know, two, three times a month at minimum, um, of commercial entities, you know, from two to 20,000 square feet. So a lot of times when we have a lot of interest, we, we just say, look, try this little in your kitchen. <laughs> you know, play with this because we have so many people talking to us literally about, well, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to get a mortgage on my house and I'm going to start a farm. I'm like, whoa, just, just hold on. <laughs> as much as I want the sale, I would yeah. prefer that you were successful and you understand what you're doing. So let's play with this for a bit. Try it. Make sure you love it. If you do love it, you know, it's still commercial. It's not a, you know, commercial volume, but at least it gives you that concept. So, and I think that's important because Again, I think this is the only industry where the most customers have no experience. Yeah, it's just a, it's a very strange industry that way. And what's so? And what's the what would be the entry level product then? Uh, entry level product, like I said, it's an in home product. We're not even trying in this case to get people to grow for yeah. for commercially, but you know, just to have your kids do it. So a yeah. Zip Garden is a new one we've done. Okay. Uh, it's a great product. It's looks decent. It grows great amount of volume, but you can put it in your kitchen and it doesn't clash. It's not just it's not just a farm in your kitchen. It's actually a kind of an appliance in your kitchen. Yeah. Um, that's a great entry level. You can play with it. It gives you it's exactly the same as a commercial system, except it's much smaller. So it gives you all the concepts and all the all the ability to play with it and try with it and have your kids get involved in it. And it's, it's you know, and, and cut your lettuce or, or your kale or whatever for your smoothies in the morning, whatever it is you do. And um, and I think that people should try something before they jump into this. <laughs> do you see anyone getting like a zip garden and maybe trying to do a little bit of like a home-based business? To, <laughs> and, and yeah, risk? well, I, I, actually, absolutely. And we do have a few in between the zip gardens to, you know, our education racks, you know, yeah. 16 towers. 16 towers can grow a lot of food. Yeah. Um, and they literally will do one or two in their garage as yeah. phase two and, you know, kind of sell to friends and family and they yeah get the bug and those are the people who will be successful i love those people yeah they 
tried it, they've done it, they've done the work. Now I can give them a really optimized commercial system where they can really kill it. Mm -hmm. I, I feel better about that group of uh, sales than the ones who are like, yeah, I'm making the, ch you know, I've got, we've got impromptu buyers, which I don't even understand. It's like, yeah, I'm buying a farm. It's like, have you ever done anything? Nope. <laughs> We're doing it I'm like okay yeah what's what's the mix in terms of like um regions uh, and do you have a specific focus do you like to keep you know stay close to where your your customers are or are you yeah no not, a, not, not at all we're we've always been actually very international um five six seven years ago we were you know 80 percent north america 20 percent international i consider yeah. canada and us to be yeah. the same yeah. uh now we're over 50 50 sometimes we're actually more international than, than north american based uh, i see a huge focus obviously in the middle east it just makes yeah. a lot of sense yeah. um also we're we're big especially with our new container farms which are very well insulated and and, and, and designed for this purpose you know extreme heat and extreme cold um we've just this this week sold a pods to both the Cayman Islands and Malta Islands and, and cutoff areas are, are big for us as well. Like I said, we're doing a small to medium, so we can actually sell something to a individual or a group of two or three people, and they can literally run a business in a secluded area. St. Pierre and Mickle on the island of France off of our coast. Yeah. Those are the areas which really make a lot of sense where they're importing all of their food. And like yeah. I said, I'm not against, we're certainly not against, and I'm supportive of the 100 and 200,000 square foot farms that are being built. It's a different concept, but it doesn't have to be, you know, 20 million, $100 million of investment to make it work. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, as I'm actually getting on a plane to Dubai this uh, in a couple of days, uh, courtesy of our sponsor of the show, Cultivated, they're, they're sponsoring a conference there. And it's the first time um, I'll be up in that part of the world, but to you, to your point, it's one of those regions that is really seeing a, a big uptick in interest in terms of, um, you know, farms and, and obviously directly correlated to the climate issues they're experiencing there. So it'll be, it'll be fun experience and it'll be interesting to see what, what's happening in that space. And I'm sure that speaks to what you're seeing as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, food security, food security, food security. Yeah. I mean, most Middle Eastern countries have, you know, decided once they realized that you know hydroponics was an actual thing that can make money it's like hold on why are we importing food yeah yeah, yeah they have energy yeah. they need very little water it just makes sense so i think i think you're going to see the whole i mean as you can as people stop potentially watering the deserts in california arizona and nevada because they run out of water i mean you're just going to and also in spain and northern africa and a few other places the same thing on that side of the pond that's the same issues exactly. I think you're going to really start to see the whole shift focus. Where like, you know, hold on, why are we doing this again? We can just grow our own. I was like, yeah. oh yeah, okay, there we go. Uh, food security um, is is the big word. So um, talk to me about the thinking around Zippod. Obviously, a lot of folks, you know, going down the route of just taking a, a typical container uh, and then just retrofitting it for you know their farms. Is that something you initially thought and then decided it makes more sense to build something from the ground up? Oh, absolutely. We actually originally owned a couple of those okay. container farms um, in the past. And there's nothing against you know utilize, utilizing that. And it's really, quite honestly, it's a sexy story to, to recycle used containers. Yeah. It's not what it used to be. They're not throwing containers out like they used to. There is not a huge amount of containers being wasted right now, especially not uh, insulated reefer containers. Mm -hmm. uh, the issue that we just ran into over and over is there just isn't the room in it to do the volume that we want to do. Mm -hmm. It is not insulated the way it actually needs to be insulated. It just can't do, you know, in, we're in Canada uh, or in the Middle East, we can't do the plus, you know, the minus 40s to the plus 40s, right? You just can't do it. Um, and then the other side of that, of course, it's just, it's just not truly a closed environment. Like we want a mm. closed environment. CA is CA for a reason. Yeah. It's not kind of CA. It's got to be close environment. Otherwise, like we just ended up with so many issues and we ended up having to redesign them so many times. We said, you know what? And that's how we got into the whole Zipco and the, you know, and the towers and, and doing our own products and our own product. And are, are they built um, for growth? Are they modular or can you, can you stack them together? Uh, they're built for growth. They're not built modular to be able to stack them. We okay. do. We do the largest, the largest footprint we can do, and yeah. still have them 
be delivered on a truck. Okay. So they are wide load without the escort. They're 40 by 10 by 10 or 10 by 10 by 40, which gives us about a 1600 extra cubic foot. And again, because we're truly vertical, we do towers, we utilize that space. Mm -hmm. uh, we have proper four rows. We have an actual aisle that you can actually work in. Uh, yeah, and we designed them specifically for the issues that we've seen in the container industry and the container industry is limited by the container. Yeah. Yeah. Wait, uh, and then uh, I imagine you have several of these in the wild now and what's been the feedback so far? Uh, so far, it's actually been fantastic. Yeah. Um, it's you have 248 foot towers plus your ceiling area, plus your work area, everything enclosed. Like that's, that's a, you know, it's almost a full time career for someone just one yeah. day where they can yeah. drop it. And I, and again, I, I still, I still absolutely believe, you know, uh, you know, a proper indoor warehouse farm is the most economical way of growing indoors you can get. But there are certain situations where that doesn't necessarily make sense. Uh, and, and the big one right now is, which we all have seen, which is, you know, construction. Yeah. You know, just, just the limitations of, you know, getting a building, fitting it out, hiring contractors, et cetera, where I can drop this. It, everything is there. You plug it in, quote unquote, plug it in uh, to it. To internet service, but you plug it in and you're growing that day. Huh. Well, yeah. it's, a, it's a little different than somebody who wants to be to start farming who now has to go hire a contractor, try to understand how to get that building ready. What's their R value they need? What's you know all of these construction things, their electricians, etc. Where this comes, everything, including dehumidification, including HVAC, already pre-charged. You just literally hook it up to power and you start growing. It makes a big difference for somebody who's trying to get going and not. And wait six months to a year uh, to be able to actually play with this. Um, naturally, like everyone else, I imagine you, you start with leafy greens. How, how much um, work or investigation have you done into other, what, what else is possible in that environment, uh, given what you've experienced so far? Thank you for asking that question, because to be quite honest, people get tired of me saying, why are you growing lettuce? <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> uh, our, our customers do grow lettuce. We grow lettuce. Uh, yeah. but. I just don't really understand the point of it. To be <laughs> uh, this is what I try to explain again, coming from the business side of things and the ROI side of things and the and the traditional farming. The input cost, the opex. If I was growing lettuce or I was growing for whatever basil, any or any other product, are pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. My sale price is two, three, four times. Why are you growing? lettuce yeah. so for us we are actually that's a big focus of us is actually really getting into high margin high value crops um especially due to the nature of our our, our actual equipment it really well suited to traceability it's well suited mm -hmm. to completely clean completely repeatable so we're actually getting into not just herbs but keep going um you know strawberries we've been doing now for six months and we're killing it on strawberries okay. but also getting into the next step which is biopharmaceuticals and bio bio cosmetics mm -hmm. you know there's so many com companies in this world importing from the tropics who have no control over the sustainability of the plants that they need to purchase for some either pharmaceutical or cosmetic application I can grow that literally in your warehouse beside you in yeah. the trunk in New York yeah. City or LA. And you don't have to worry about child labor or cutting down the rainforest or whatever else that is. And you can now trace every single ounce of that because that is super important, which they cannot currently do. So that is a big focus for us is actually going to more and more higher end crops, more difficult crops. Also, and even in the traditional sense, I mean, the whole industry still to this day is pretty much just taking field crop seed and put it inside, which makes absolutely no sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the reason field crops are there is because, of, you know, being able to travel, being able to not bruise, et cetera, all the issues that we're fixing, but we're still using the same seed. I think that, that's a whole, that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother industry, which is, I can't wait for that to really get going. I mean, even just using heritage breed um, crops, which have been almost lost, which we can now use. Because traditionally, our customers are right beside their, beside their customers. So it's, you know, same day harvest, same day set. And what are some of the crops or some of the, the plants that you're growing for for these industries? Um, I'll tell you a couple that I don't mind telling you yet. Yeah. Some, of them I, some of them I won't. Yeah, yeah. Um, things like St. John's wort, 
okay. uh, stevia, like yeah. some really, really cool things that I'm like, it grows so well. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we've even tried a lot of things like, um, like even things like, uh, like aloe. Mm. Like seconds, which I again, oh. we're, we're on a 24 hour drip cycle. Mm. I guess would not grow our, they go like crazy. Um, even things like ornamentals and flowers and stuff, every it all grows well. And yeah, hydroponics is hydroponics. Um, they all grow very well. It's just whether or not it makes economic sense. And that's the whole point. I mean, to which one of those for the specific market you're in, for the specific customer or, or that you're looking to target makes the most sense for you from an ROI perspective. It just makes a lot of sense to be thinking about it uh, in the in those terms. Well, I mean, the obvious one is is, leafy, is baby greens. Like, yeah. let's just go there because if you're going to grow lettuce, why not just grow baby greens? Yeah. It's the same thing. You just harvest more often and you get yeah. more money. Yeah. So, to me, I, I always try to tell people just start there. Like, there's your basics, um, and then. Actually, I think there's a big market to be had, and it's, it hasn't really been touched with. Is is um, very specialty crops. A lot of them, which are internationally focused, our international communities in North America and in Europe and across are becoming bigger, where they're importing certain plants that they have to import from, you know, potentially Asia or wherever else it is. Yeah. Um, and and again, it still comes back to we're small to medium, so it's getting connected to your farmer. So what does your local community want? You know what is what is in your community what is the makeup of your community um and then actually getting to know them and finding out what they can and cannot do uh, if you want to go on the other side of it you know the pharmaceutical etc like i think there's definitely the, the future but for our customers today it's you know, get to know your local community your local restaurants your local grocery store and really sell to them and sell what they want you may have just answered this question, but if you have someone who's coming to you, you know, just get, about to get started, looking to get into this, and maybe you know, looking at, at at growing some of these specialty greens, you know, what else can they do in terms of homework, in terms of prep work? You know, you mentioned looking at, at who, who's buying what in your area, so to have the best chance of success. Um, it kind of yeah, it goes back to to way back. You 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 can grow whatever you like, but you have to sell it. Yeah. So market, what is your market? Mm -hmm. What is your market? How do you connect with that market? What's your story? It's, it's like any other small, you know, get to know your farmer, farmer, farmer's markets, you know, CSAs, et cetera. I mean, selling retail obviously is, is always better if you can. The margins are better, but now of course it's more work, et cetera. And everyone, not everyone, it seems to be, uh, the, and I, I don't, I dissuade from this. This seems to be the nature is everyone is looking for what's that grocery store that wants to take the most amount of whatever Boston lettuce. I'm like, why would you bother? Yeah. You, you can, you can grow, you know, a quarter as much and make the same amount of money selling to your local, cons your local people who are actually also dependable and they, they support you and they get to know you. And then like, that's where, that's where it is. Again, I'm not against the very large farms in any shape or form. Yeah. We sell farms to people who need to make money, and this is their new career. And small to medium, like I said, two thousand to twenty thousand square feet, where you know you could be a you know a, a mom and pop shop concept, selling at the local farmers market and make enough money to to survive, up to you know five, ten, twenty people, but still local, even your local grocery store. So to me, local is the most the, the the best brand there currently is yeah. it, beats, it beats organics hands down now local 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 so be that local farmer that's what i tell them that's that's absolutely great advice uh, where are you seeing the most growth out of all the product lines um it's actually funny uh we are seeing a huge change when we like i said we're one of the older companies we've been selling commercially uh for 10 years now uh we've seen a huge change over the years it used to be a lot of diy mom and pop type concepts we are now seeing in, in the industry is becoming legitimized. I mean, like take take plenty and take uh, take you know Walmart's investment in plenty. It's mainstream. Like there's there's no more doubt. This is this is this is where it's going. So, but we've seen a huge change where we're getting institutions, we're getting larger corps uh, who just want to get involved, and we've seen that that's a big shift for us. Uh, it's great because the sale numbers are bigger. Also, the sales cycles are longer, so I mean, it's kind of give and take. But we're seeing it switch over from just the individual 
one person want to do something in their backyard or a little hoop house or you know whatever to institutions to you know we signed a contract last year with sedex so like those companies are all all want to get on board we have we've had probably every major grocery store chain um, in the country in our boardroom asking to be involved they want to buy they want to get involved um sometimes right now actually the issue is is matching up the buyer and finding the grower because we, we manufacture equipment we're not the grower necessarily we grow farmers and we need to grow some more farmers to actually the supply is there i mean sorry the demand is there we really just need more people actually to jump on that and to do that i mean the biggest challenge is typically financing yeah. so in this industry i saw that you were one of the companies that signed the manifesto uh, can you talk about how you did someone bring that to you? Did you how did you discover it, and and what made you want to jump on board? Yeah, um, actually, it was brought to us. Uh, they approached us on on that. Um, at first, I'm like, what? Manifesto so sounds a little bit too uh, <laughs> to a Unabomber concept, yeah. but uh, then I'm like, I read, I'm like, yeah. actually, this actually makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, and I do absolutely support the industry needs to get over themselves a little bit and realize yeah. that we're all on the same page here. Sure, like there's, sure. there's no one silver bullet. There's no one solution for, 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 for the, you know, feeding the world concept. Um, but to actually get involved in something where we are committing to being that long-term player and actually helping to change what needs to be changed. So this industry itself can actually long-term be what we know it will end up being. So it's mm -hmm. just you know, actually, committing to that and and the other companies that, that committed that I respect them all as well um, and I think we do need as an industry to stop being so competitive that we think we all have some secret sauce yeah. um, and we do to a degree and that's great but we're really it's an industry that's growing and it's it's still growing plants it's hydroponics it's not that complicated yeah and I will say for the most part uh, of all the conversations I had it, it really feels like an all hands on deck moment and it feels like we were all moving towards the same goal. There's there's enough business for everyone. There's enough need to, to solve this problem on across the globe. So it doesn't feel like there's gonna be any shortage of, uh, of activity and interest in this space for a, a long time to come. So that being said, I know it's hard to plan anything beyond three or five years, especially in business. And I'm sure you, you can you can speak to that uh, having run several yourself. So when you think long-term, when you think roadmap future for, for ZipGrow, maybe six months to a year, what's top of mind for you? Yeah, difficult question. Uh, and of course, what we're talking about every day right now, I think I think what, what comes to mind is, is trying to kind of get back to basics a little bit. So we've been, again, everything's based on our, around our tower system. And I think we've got the gamut now of, you know, to from hobby to large larger scale indoor mm -hmm. or greenhouse growing. Um, and I think right now it kind of get we're getting back to basics. And we we we've never done sales, we've never done marketing ever in our industry, our history, to be honest. Mm. Um, you know, a few little press releases or whatever. But that's 100 percent because we are known as the educators and the supporters. So we're actually reinventing that side a little more. I mean, we've had things like uh, Upstart University, complete online courses. We've now recently refocused back into our community. We're doing an eight-week uh, hydroponics course at a local community college. We're going back to educating, educating, educating. Yeah. Um, and I think that's where we're refocusing a lot of our efforts is realizing that the industry itself is going to grow out of necessity. Yeah. Just because we need more food, we need food security, we having issues with water supply, et cetera. Um, and from our perspective is we want to continue to be the one that supports the industry itself, supports new people, supports young kids. We're getting into education in schools a lot more. We're doing curriculums. We're actually teaching community colleges. We're focusing on educating so that more people, it, it just baffles me when I go to a show or something and people haven't heard of growing indoors. <laughs> I'm like, what? <laughs> but it's still most of the population, right? It's yeah, still yeah, true. Yeah. They're like, oh, this is so new. I'm like, well, we don't want it to be new anymore. So we want they want the average person to understand it so well that it's just adopted as a norm instead of the norm is the I mean, I don't know why people think it's so natural to water a desert 
-hmm. and then harvest that like that's natural growing to me there's nothing natural about that um the natural should be conservation of water and food security and food safety is that something that you see as a possible challenge in terms of uh, talent? You know, because I've, I've noticed that, that, that that's a, it's a common thread. Um, I, I, we recently updated a site we have called Vertical Farming Jobs, and we've created what we call a collective for people who are looking for jobs in the industry. And in, in, in the first day that I posted it, like six people just submitted like their resumes. Like they wanted, they're really interested in this space. And that's just like, I'm sure just the tip of the iceberg. But, you know, there's a lot of, um, to your point, educating them at a younger level is probably you know part of the solution. But do you see that as a, as a challenge going forward? Well, I mean, take a look at an industry currently in North America and or Europe, uh, you know, finding talent and funding manpower is, is huge. Yeah. Funding skilled learn learned people in this industry is almost unheard of um and we still are at the stage of just assuming we're going to bring people on who have great attitudes and train them uh if i can find some that aren't and actually we are starting to do that and and we are seeing i I shouldn't say that we're actually starting to see especially the more recent college Mm -hmm. grads from from some of the universities like guelph in in canada that's a Mm -hmm. high school um who understand this quite well who are like, yeah, we want to get involved in this industry well, or or something similar. So we are seeing that for certain a little bit more, but we still are at that stage where we're still training, you know, good skills. Oh, you want to change the world? Come join us. I'm going to help you. We're going to help you, and, and you're going to learn that. But um, it, it's becoming less of that, but I think we all need to be doing better at, you know, educating the young and educating the consumer, period, about what this industry really is and what it isn't. Yeah. Yeah, I think things like the manifesto help to get the word out at a, at a wider scale to the folks and just kind of get some of this language in, into, you know, the, the the common areas where where people are, you know, like to your point, they hear the term and they think it's something to have to do with like robots <laughs> and skyscrapers. Oh, absolutely. And then you go to, it depends where you are, whether in the U.S. and you can be organic or yeah. you're in Canada yeah, yeah. you can't be organic or yeah. in Europe where it's like, what, it's not soil, it must be terrible for you. It's like, <laughs> Just yeah. kind of getting some common knowledge out there, getting some common language, educating the consumer so this isn't a big deal. We shouldn't have to try to convince them that this is healthy. I, I still just baffles me every time someone says, okay, well, is it healthy? I'm like, what? <laughs> oh, because it's not going so. Maybe it might not be healthy. I'm like, yeah. we give it everything it wants. It's much healthier. <laughs> really? I'm like, yeah. it is still, we, we shouldn't have to be still explaining that. Well, it's funny because I, I came back from indoor ag tech, uh, NYC, and I was in, in uh, I live in Minneapolis now, but I grew up in New York, so I went to go visit my folks. I was explaining to my, my dad about this vertical farming, and I was really struggling to, like, explain. You know, it's, it's grown. It's, like, across the river, so it just comes into New York City, and it's, it's very fresh. And he's like, yeah, if it comes from California, and he's like, they get on the plane, and they just have it there, and it, and it works, and, it, and, it, and it's been doing it for years. And, 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 I was, and I was really interesting because I was really struggling struggling to, to kind of explain like the benefit and organic and local and, and, and transportation. So there is like, I, I experienced it firsthand, you know, with, yeah. with my family. And, and I think there's, there's an education, um, you know, maybe there's, we need a new documentary or something just specifically for, for vertical yeah. farming or something like that. So I, well, I, I, I agree. Actually, you're from, you, Harry, you mentioned from Minneapolis, uh, you were talking about how things are changing. One of the, one of this really cool, uh, we've got a, We've been working this for years and years. Uh, a big potential uh, customer in in Minneapolis, uh, designing a complete community around. And I, we're seeing this a lot more. You're seeing this in a lot of things. And, and it's actually some of these things are being built around, you know, growing your own food. In this case, uh, look it up if you're curious. Just it's an aside, not from the interview. I guess from, uh, called the place, okay. which is. A, uh, in Minneapolis, a full community being built out, and it looks like they've got their funding now. It's going to be a, big, a real thing, a uh, yeah, full community with the community being built around the actual farms, which are going to supply the community. That's, I think, that's so fascinating. That's really cool. That's really cool, actually. And is, is that a project that Zip Crow's working on? Yeah, we've been working on that for four years, wow. and it's finally coming to fruition. It looks well, nice. yeah. Keep me keep me keep me informed. I'd love to go check it out. Uh, if there's anything I can do to to kind of like help them or, or do a little story on them, I mean, I, the fact that it's here in my backyard is, is something I get my hands on. That'd be great. Yeah, I'll send you. I'll send you a link to them. It's pretty fun. It's pretty exciting. We've been working it forever. Yeah. Um, and they finally looks like they're getting it down. So it's just a community a community of people building houses, etc. But based around a sustainable concept. Oh. 
uh, where it's, it's not a commune kind of thing, but it, it's a, uh, maybe a little, uh, but it, it, I think it's pretty fun. I, anyway, it'd be interesting to do a story on it. Yeah, very cool. What's a tough question you had to ask yourself recently? Oh, what's my sales cycle look like? Um, who was my customer? Uh, it's changing quickly. Okay. Um, there's been a few of those. Uh, you know, the biggest issue I have, like probably you and a lot of other entrepreneurs, is like I can't just do everything. I need to just stop because yeah. I'm like, oh, this is exciting. Let's do that. Oh, that's exciting. Yeah. Uh, and I, actually, I'll be actually I'll actually be uh, frank with you a little bit. One of the things I've actually been struggling with personally is, you know. I and a lot of the other equipment manufacturers are selling equipment and, and there's and there's no doubt that this is actually this is higher end product. Mm -hmm. Stuff's not cheap. Yeah. And yes, you could do a really cheap version of some of the stuff, I guess. But and and we do we are wanting to help feed the world, et cetera. But you know, how can I develop something around our tech that is cheap enough that I can actually go and help those countries that really need food, not just the European North American countries who really want to pay more for quality food. Yeah. Um, not sure if I wanted to be that honest with it, but it's just something I've actually been thinking about a lot lately. It's like, you know, I really love designing the system where people can actually make an ROI and in, mm. the consumer in this case are, are they're more affluent. Yeah. Um, even though we can and do try to promote and, you know, those food deserts and et cetera in North America and Europe and, and, and wherever, but, how can we actually really help those people who are having issues eating? Who really need it. Who really need it today. Yeah. I've been thinking about that a lot. Well, again, keep me updated if there's anything you need to do to spread the word or to get the word out uh, in that area. And obviously, uh, I'd love to be, be that, that, that bullhorn for you. <laughs> How? Uh, let me ask you a quick question. How is... Uh, you're at what 70 some podcast now or 60 something yeah, closing in on yeah, 60, 30, 60 plus yeah uh is this all you thought it would be Ooh. how is this different than when you started out this this journey it was just a, you know it's just curiosity my background is podcasting i had a, my first shows in 2014 it's called podcast junkies it's a show where i interview other podcasters so okay. i've cut my teeth there 300 plus interviews um and then we we have a podcast agency that produces shows. So I had I had, I had the, the technical pieces done, but then I obviously I'm, I'm just naturally curious. I love long form conversations because I feel that's the best opportunity to, to tell stories. I love origin stories. And I'm an entrepreneur myself, you know, so I'm always curious. You know what, yeah. you know what 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 makes people tick, what gets people out of bed in the morning, and um, I think it it's interesting that the show kicked off just as COVID was hitting. That was not intentional. I, I mean, this was about end of 2019 when the, when the idea was brewing. And it just just seemed like the right thing to be focusing on. And it's, you know, again, supply chain issues, you know, food deserts, all these things just started popping up. And I, and it feels like, wow, there's so many stories to tell. I thought I would run out of interviews. <laughs> I thought I'd run out of people to talk to. But then, you know, I go to Interact Tech and I see I come back with 20 new names to, to interview on the show. You know, glad I, I, yeah, we got connected as well. And there's just more needs to be told. I've got people reaching out to me and saying, hey, I'm looking to get into the industry. I've been binging your podcasts. I'm like so fascinated to hear these stories are very inspiring. I can't wait to enter the space. Um, so just like I'm, I'm trying to think about, okay, I have the platform now, you know, I, we've got a newsletter going out, we've got vertical farming jobs going out, you know, what else can we do to just help educate, get the word out, tell these stories and let people know there's no one path into this industry. Like so many of these stories in the beginning of people like didn't even think they were going to be in, in vertical farming, yeah, you know, yeah. to begin with. And then, you know, a couple of years yeah, later, like they, my, they like find me. themselves, yeah, running a company. So it's, it's, I'm so amazed by by what's happening i'm so grateful to to be you know having a front row seat to these stories and i just want to use that platform as much as possible to to tell these stories and to, to show people what's happening you know there's all the stuff that's happening in africa india i'm in mean, dubai like it's just the middle east it's just there's a lot more that needs to be told and a lot more to your point um education that needs to happen so you know to the extent that this platform can help that and branches of this platform can can do more of that is definitely something that's sort of made it my mission to do as well
Oh, fantastic. I, I love your style, by the way. The, the one I, I haven't listened to all of them, but I listened to a big whack of them. Yeah. Um, love the style. I think you're doing a great job. So, um, And I appreciate, by the way, your request. And I'd be more than happy to answer anything else. I wasn't cutting this off. Sorry. <laughs> no, uh, no it was actually, it's actually really good. I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah. So we're just uh, closing in on the interview. The area always tends to go by really fast. Um, yeah. okay. Just lastly, like, what, what, what gets you out of bed in the morning? What, what keeps you going? Uh, learning. Mm -hmm. I just... I just want to learn everything. I want to understand. I just want to understand. I want to figure something out. I want to. I just want to figure out everything. I I, I, I often I often I often uh, joke that you know you know on my deathbed I'm going to finally say okay I've got it I know the, I know the meaning of life and then I will die. Um, that's literally all I want to do is just figure out everything. Uh, again, it becomes an issue when I'm like, oh, this could work, and I'm like, oh, I should start a new company. <laughs> uh, just because I think yes. it might work, I shouldn't do it. But but I will I will say that um, as far as the industry specifically and Zipgrow specifically, I mean, it's just seeing the dedication of both my team, which mm -hmm. I, I just can't say enough about, who will literally give a shit, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And it's the customers who are like, they motivate the hell out of me. It's like when you get this customers like, oh, just dying to get into this, and they've been talking to everyone, and they can't, they can't wait to you know sell to their their to their neighbors and, and supply us. I'm like, oh shit, that's why we're doing it. I forgot. You know, sometimes you can get so caught up in the day to day, um, business is business, and you know, cash flow and all those things that are fun things to deal with. And it's like, oh yeah, this is what we're doing it for. Yeah. It's like, oh, this is great. So our customers and my team, they motivate the hell out of me. So given that you've listened to uh, several of the episodes and I appreciate you listening, I never take listenership for granted as a podcaster. I appreciate people taking, that's an hour of your day <laughs> for, per episode. But now that you, you know the audience is your peers, your colleagues in the space, I always like to leave some time at the end of each of these now uh, for you. And if you have a message, if you have anything you want to say to folks in the industry, your colleagues, people listening, um, anything come to mind? Yeah, I think the message that I, I want to get across a little bit is, you know, all of the all of the all of the hype out there, all of the advertising, all of the the good news is all about typically things that never happen or never will happen. You know, it's it's the one or two hundred thousand, two hundred thousand square foot farms that may never make any money. And I think I really just want to focus. And I think it's one of your last podcasters. I think it was Ali had mentioned small to medium farms, like you. This is actually a real thing. The reason that we're, and again, I'm not against the large farms, but the reason at least we got into this is to fix the broken food model and just to duplicate it indoors to me isn't really fixing it. It's just doing the same. Uh, you know, my, you know, my wife and I, but mostly my wife, you know, we are farmers in a local community. They go to, we go to, she goes to the farmer's market. She's connected to her buyers. That is invaluable and it's the one thing i think we need to get back to and this is we can do and you can make money and you can be that local farmer in downtown toronto or new york or la or chicago or where have you and you can have your group of of customers who get to know the farmer and understand what you're going through and understand all that concept and you can actually make some money and you can provide food security and like it's it's back to the family farm and that's what we're doing we're, we're, we're reselling and we're retraining the family farm and you take a look at the farming industry as a whole, and again, from the traditional side, it's dwindling more and more. There's less and less farmers. The age is going up and up. It's consolidation, consolidation, consolidation. And the barrier to entry is you just can't buy farmland anymore. You can't do that. It's just not available. This is actually a way of getting more people back into agriculture and back into being connected with the food that you eat. And I just, I want people, I want the industry to stop only focusing on the huge, massive farms that get all the credit. Yeah. And I think they're important. I really do. I'm not against them. But there's also that small and medium good news story where somebody can start this farm and have a local following of people in their little local area and in their local community, and you can get to know your farmer and buy your vegetables. Yeah. I think right. we need to not forget that. Local is the new organic. Local is better than organic now. <laughs> Well, Eric, thank you so much. I really enjoyed this conversation uh, and I, I learned a lot and get, it, it, these all get me excited. These all get me motivated at, at the future of what's possible. I really appreciate you coming on, sharing your story. Zipgrow.com, if folks want to learn more about the company, anywhere else you want to point people to? 
Zipgrow.com, Zippod, our new container farms, Zipgarden, our new in-house uh, bundle. Um, yeah, and and anything anything that people can do to, to educate the world that this is where we're going to end up having to be. I'm, I'm all over it. Yeah, I appreciate you, you coming on and sharing your story. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate your time.